before getting to just the, the, the drug, um, you know, sequencing or, or interaction parts, Jason, just thinking of the, the mechanism of, of, of TVEC, if you had a patient in front of you who you and your surgical colleagues thought was sort of borderline resectable, either, you know, within transits that are not so numerous mm -hmm. um, or regional lymphadenopathy alone where resection, you know, is, is feasible, could you imagine, um, you know, using a, a window of time to inject that patient uh, before taking them to surgery? Uh, in other words, kind of a window uh, of, you know, of opportunity? And so I, I absolutely think that that's an interesting approach. Um, I think it's something that probably should be more robustly investigated. Yeah. But I have to say that if we take from our colleagues in the breast cancer field of using neoadjuvant chemotherapy, correlating that with pathologic complete response with long-term survival, I, I think that approach is, is very interesting to think about. We, we see a fair number of patients where the question about resectability yeah. really is in the eye of the beholder. And certainly if we can do anything to make it more likely that the resection really will get the patient disease-free, I, I really think any approach would be interesting in that area. I mean, Jeff was alluding to, uh, you know, this uh, so-called, you know, priming effect. Maybe you could expand a little bit for, you know, listeners for whom immune therapy is still a pretty new concept. Um, you know, what, what is it that, that local injection and the effect on tumor could do that's, that's different than what we, uh, you know, believe the CTLA-4 PD-1 blocking immune checkpoint antibodies can do? Well, it's... Um, it really has the potential to de novo generate the, all the, the aspects of an immune response. We have, to, we have to remember that we use immunotherapy, but what was immunotherapy, how, why did our bodies develop? Well, yeah. to fight infections. Yeah. And that process was triggered around the generation of gamma interferon and the actual response to a local problem. And that's really what you're starting to do with TVEC. You're injecting it into the tumor, blowing up the tumor, releasing these immune molecules. That's going to like prime the pump, as we've said here before. And I think that that has the potential to start a local reaction that perhaps over time we can find ways to generate and amplify with other agents as well. And I'll just throw on that there is data as well with TVEC with ipilimumab, which has actually looked quite impressive as well, relatively speaking to what we knew about ipilimumab alone. Uh, but again, more data is needed, but I think that that, that seconds this idea that combinatorial approaches in the future really could be a, an impressive way to go forward. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but one of the nice things about IPI is that almost anything that you add to IPI appears to at least be additive or in some cases, you could argue synergistic. Um, so I like the idea of creating what I would think of as a danger signal. So, you know, remember, Polly Matzinger described this concept of the danger signal to alert the immune system uh, to break tolerance. And I think that giving TVEC perhaps creates a danger signal in the local regional disease, which could, I suppose, lead to this concept of immune priming and dissemination of T cells out of the lymph nodes into the circulation to have a systemic effect, but it's not gonna happen with TVEC alone. Mm -hmm. Again, as I remember, the data suggested a 16% response rate in right. distant disease. Durable response rate. Durable right. response rate with no systemic um, uh, survival advantage with M1B or M1C disease. Right. All the benefit was in the local regional stage 3B, 3Cs, the intransit metastases, and the M1A disease. And those are the patients that I would think uh, should be injected I mean, for me, one of the issues is a practical one, and, and I'd be interested to hear everyone else's opinion. It takes time to do a local injection, and I think mm -hmm. there is probably some requirement at the institutions, since you're using a virus, to clean the room before and then clean the room after, and this all takes some time. Right. Well, also, this came up during the clinical trials, and so this actually is going to become a clinical-grade therapeutic that goes in the general pharmacy. And so it's actually passed muster for most um, uh, like GMP facilities, you don't have to specially produce it. Uh, so we went through all of that for the clinical trial, and that slowed things down a fair amount. But now it's, it's been FDA approved to sort of just be housed with other. Uh, it's, it's good. It's a good point, though. That it, we went through the same thing, mm -hmm. and initially there was concern. We had options like s sending the patients to a hotel or actually yeah. admitting yeah. them into the hospital, an oncology unit. There was concern about pregnant women in the waiting room. You know, is this virus going to get out there? Uh, that sort of thing, and the, the cleaning up each room afterwards. There, there really isn't any of that. Yeah. Do um, you actually clean the rooms afterwards no. in your experience? No. So really it's made it a lot easier, it sounds like. One logistical thing is, is the preparation of the, of the injection. That takes, uh, it has to be thought, I, I don't know how it's going to come out, but it, it, at least the product we were using has to be thought for about 45 minutes right. uh, to prepare it. So that, that's a lot of waiting because they don't actually start to mm -hmm. prepare it into the until the patient actually shows up. Yeah, I mean, storage in a minus 70 freezer, in mm -hmm. fact, is, is in, invest, in investigation and in approval 
is the, the you know the starting point. So it, it does you know, one has to give a bit of time before that uh, it you know, will equilibrate to room temperature. Yeah. Four four milliliters of uh, of injectate. Jeff, just before we leave this topic, I mean this is this isn't the first oncolytic virus um, to ever have been uh, tried as a cancer therapeutic, although perhaps the most heavily. Uh, or thoroughly investigated. Um, there are others um, that are being considered, and even uh, you know one that I'm aware of, um, the Coxsackie virus uh, that, that's in clinical development. Also, I mean, what, what's your sense in terms of, of what other innovation could come in this space? Well, I think that the idea of engineering GM-CSF into the virus is a reasonable one, but it's really a kind of a first-generation mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, engineering co-stimulatory molecules. Other, for example, the ability to uh, encode like a single chain molecule that might block PD-1 within that molecule so that if it's in the tumor microenvironment where you directly inject it, could you actually then block PD-1 using that engineered single chain antibody? Could you block CTLA-4 mm. uh, in the tumor microenvironment? So there are uh, a lot of other molecules other than GM-CSF that I could think of that right. logically would make sense. Right. I've seen the Coxsackie virus data. As I remember, they don't really engineer the Coxsackie That's virus. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I uh, have liked the data. I, I think I heard Robert Antbaca, who's a real leader in the field of yeah. local regional therapy, present the data. I think it has some promise. Um, I think it should certainly be pursued. I agree with Renee wholeheartedly that at the end of the day, this will not be a standalone agent. Right. We will see our immunologic and biologic drugs all in combinations, and the only question is, how many can we logically get together without undue toxicity? Yeah. And that's going to keep us in business for a long time, yeah, because that's you. complex. One other um, area that I wanted to just touch on for injectables as well are the area of cyclic dinucleotides, which for the audience is probably a little bit far afield, but we've learned a lot about how the body senses whether or not there's cancer present. And we can now actually directly agonize some of those pathways by especially one called sting. And so that's another molecule that's coming in the injectable space very soon, which looks highly efficacious. And so we'll be very interested in this topically with the injectables. I think there's many ways we could do it, mm -hmm. do many different approaches. So I think there's a lot more to come in this field.